This is a simple model to show how the COVID-19 pandemic can make its way through the U.S. population. We begin with a very simple approach. It's called the SIR approach, which divides the population into three distinct pools. S is the population of susceptible people, that is those people who can get the infection. I is the current population of those who are known to be infected. And R is the population of those who have recovered or unfortunately died from the pandemic. The simple model looks like this. We take people who are susceptible to infection and we move them to the infected pool and some of those who are infected then recover. There are simple models that govern the rate at which people leave the susceptible population. It is given by this equation here. The rate at which the infected population grows, which is given here, and the rate at which the recovered population grows, which is given there. You'll notice there's something important in here, and that is this factor beta, which is the probability of transmission from an infected person to a susceptible person. And N, which is the total population within which the virus is circulating. You'll notice it's very simple here. We're, we're multiplying the susceptible and infected populations together, and those are then adjusted by this free prefactor, which has to do with transmissibility and the size of the population. So what we are imagining is that infected people actually move around completely within the susceptible pool, which is not entirely correct. Nonetheless, this is a simple assumption that is used to look at how epidemics grow in a population. What we then do is say, all right, how many infected people are there today? Well, what we do is we take the number of infected people from the day before, we add to that the number of people from the susceptible population who have now been infected, and we remove from that the number of people who have recovered. Recovered. It's actually a very simple set of equations and something that's very easy for a computer to do. So you'll notice that the infection growth depends strongly upon the transmissivity. The transmissivity can simply be thought of as if you encounter a sick person, how likely are you to get the illness? This is called the transmission probability, which I have called the factor beta in these equations. The number of new people infected depends upon the circulation of infection among the uninfected. Those are the vectors of transmission that the uninfected population encounter. And then based upon that probability, when you encounter an infected person, you may or may not actually pick up the infection. So what's clear, what's absolutely clear, clear is that to control the growth of the epidemic, we have to limit the vectors of transmission so that we can control how many people are actually going to get infected. So you can imagine it in this way. If you, you think of this blue dot on the left side over here as the population of susceptible people, and you introduce a number of infected individuals into that population pool, then as time progresses, that's this arrow down here to the right, what happens is the infected pool grows and removes people from the susceptible population. The susceptible population shrinks as the infected pool grows. So I just imagine doing this by showing that the infected circle area is increasing. And some of those infected people are actually removed. They either recover or they die. And so this is a simple graphic representation of what is going on in this systems dynamics model. Now, if you use a computer to run what happens when you run the, when you run this model you have to input the transmissivity and the recovery rates and what you will find that after introduction into a population you see that this red curve uh, these red dots represent the infection the number of infections rising and then falling the blue curves are the susceptible pool of individuals that can become infected and as more and more people get infected, we reduce the sizes of the susceptible pool. And so we reach a peak limit 
of the number of infected and then it tapers off over time. So as people become infected, the pool of susceptible people drops while the infection climbs, it peaks, and then it falls off. So we can change the location of this peak. That's something that, that Dr. Fauci was talking about. If we just allow the, the infection to run freely in a population, the number of infected people can rise very steeply as a function of time and then reach a peak that's rather large and then fall off. Well, if we can change the transmissivity through social distancing, we can take that peak and we can drive it off to the right, which is this second curve here. And you'll notice also that the, the absolute peak value, that is the height of that curve, is now lower than the height of the initial unmitigated infection curve. And so you're doing two things. You're changing the rate at which people are being infected and you are decreasing the absolute maximum number of people that infected. Now, if you want to apply this model to the COVID-19, we have to figure out what the heck the transmissivity is, what the recovery term is. We need to understand the mortality rate so we can figure out how many people, if infected, will die. And we, we'd like to know how long a person, an infected person circulates to transmit infection. So the way to do that is I downloaded all the Johns Hopkins data from a GitHub site that they had. And these blue circles over here on this curve represent data from South Korea uh, up through about the, the 9th of March. And then I take the SIR systems dynamic model, that are that is these little orange circles, and I do a best fit to the South Korean data. And when I do that, I get a transmissivity here of 0 0.237 and I get a recovery factor of something on the order of 0 0.025, okay? The, now, why did I choose the South Korean data? I chose the South Korean data because it is the, the biggest data set that we have that I feel we can trust, and that's all I have access to right now. So it's the best we can do. Um, what we find from that South Korean data also is that about 0.62% of the infected people actually die. If we take this uh, transmissivity number up here, this 0.237, and we multiply it by a number of days, infectious days, we get what's called the R0 value, which is about 2.37 in this case. So that's what we're going to use. I'm going to take this beta right here, this recovery factor, and this mortality rate, and then I'm going to run that on the U.S. population. So that's how we're going to predict to get some handle. Look, I'm not saying it's ex it's exact, but we're going to get some handle on the number of infections we can expect within the United States. So if I did that, um, I get a very, very high number of infections. So it I decided since our population is about 345 million people and the, the model assumes that infected interact with that entire population, which isn't really the case. It happens city by city. So I lowered the transmissivity from 0 0.237 to 0 0.17. And how did I do that? What I did is I matched, I matched the, the, infection numbers in the United States on the 20th of January so that the curve would hit that number exactly. And then I looked at how many people would be infected as a function of time as we moved forward. That is the blue curve on this graph. And what you see is by about the middle of June, well, no, near the end of June, we get a peak of 191 million people in the United States infected with the coronavirus. Now, that is assuming we do nothing. We have already begun to do things. We've enacted social distancing, we've canceled classes, people are teleworking. So th it's not gonna be as bad as this particular epidemic model is predicting, but this is, this is a reasonably good assumption for what would happen if we did nothing. And what you will notice is that the orange curve represents 
the, the number of deaths. So if we did nothing and we just let this circulate freely in this country, we would expect 58% of our population to be infected with the coronavirus. And by a year from today, so by the, the end of January in 2021, we would anticipate around 2 million deaths. So this is 2 million deaths out here. And that is not something that we want to live with. And so we are going to do a lot more than that. And so if you look at the number infected, we're, we're expecting around, you know, people are saying something like 20% of those infected actually need go to the hospital. So if we did nothing, we would have on the order of 38 million people needing hospital care. And that would overwhelm our medical system. And that's absolutely why you have to do so quarantine is something that you can do that limits the population that is exposed until the virus dies out. China did an excellent job of quarantine. So suppose we quarantined in the United States. Imagine you could do the following. Imagine you could quarantine 4 million people in LA, 725,000 people in Seattle, 8.6 million in New York, and on the order of 500,000 in Atlanta for a total of roughly 14 million people and you run the SIR model on that population, what you find is instead of 191 million being infected, your peak infection is 8 million, your deaths are 87,000, and uh, you know it's, it's much easier to handle. And you've also moved the peak uh, to June 1st. So it's actually come a little bit sooner. Look, this is still a lot of people, so we have to be more aggressive than that, in fact. And so if you run the model using a computer simulation for various values of the transmissivity, I show here in black a run for a transmissivity of 0.237 or something like 24% probability of getting an infection if you are exposed to an infected person. This blue curve is for 17% probability of transmission. And this red curve is for an 8% probability of transmission. And what you'll notice is that the peaks move to the right. And so, so the peaks move to the right if you can decrease transmissivity. And the maximum value actually drops. So the peak value goes down. By moving the peaks to the right, you are buying yourself prep time so that you can better respond to the event. By decreasing the absolute total number of individuals that have it, you are decreasing the load on the healthcare system. So whatever you can do to decrease transmissivity is going to buy you time and reduce the overall number. So that's a very good thing. So this little, uh, this, this strange color blue in here is where I started off with a beta of 0.237, but we implement social distancing 30 days in so that we can decrease the transmissivity by half. And then I decrease it by half again in another month by even more severe quarantining and social uh, distancing. And what that does is it pushes the peak to the right and it drives the peak down. So social distancing works. This is why we are doing it. The real problem and the reason we have to push the peak out First, you want to avoid all these uh, fatalities, but we also have the following problem of our healthcare system. We have on the order of 160,000 ventilators with another 8,900 in stockpile. Our hospitals have 2.8 hospital beds for every thousand people. Given our population on the order of 345 million, it means we have something like a million hospital beds. Uh, if 20% of the infected for a beta value of 0.17, if 20% of those people at peak need hospitalization, we would need 44 million beds. We simply don't have it. Uh, and we don't have, uh, we just can't care for that many people. So we have to do everything we can to push the peak off to the right, decrease the transmissivity so that we can better handle the number of patients that we will see. So I have to say that there are some assumptions in these models. 
The first is that the infected mix with the entire population, and this will overestimate the number. So this is a, a, a pretty much a worst case scenario, as long as you know what the transmissivity is. We don't have a really good model of exposure, the duration of infectiousness and the incubation. None of that is in there. I don't have city by city growth rates, which include transmission pathways from city to city, all of which will change these numbers and change the model outputs. But these still give you a general idea of how serious the problem actually is.